Hello, everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 165 of the Movement Debrief. And today, folks, sit up straight or slouch, or maybe you don't have a choice because we're going to talk about slouching versus arching the back and all the other wild and crazy things that your thorax might be doing. If you are someone who has movement restrictions and you present with a certain type of posture through your torso and you're wondering what to do about it, well, your boy Big Z will have you covered. Because your boy Z, who is big, has got a bunch of questions that have been asked by the people. They will be answered for the people by this people right here. Fam recognized fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The only question today, because it's a big one, folks. It comes from Gail. And here's what Gail asks. Hey, Zach, I'm wondering how the ribs can flare outward and tilt the thorax posteriorly when it seems that the ribs and pelvis are crunching together and dragging the sternum downward during exhalation. Wouldn't this draw the ribs inward instead of outward and create an anterior tilt of the thorax? With that said, how can one lift their rib cage to keep it from crunching on the exhale while simultaneously keeping the ribs from flaring and the thorax tilting posteriorly? I've been struggling with this recently as it's been causing me to feel very nauseous during and after certain physical activities, such as running and core exercises, because it feels like lots of pressure is being put on the contents of my stomach while exhaling or attempting to squeeze my core. Folks, I say it all the time, but this right here is an unbelievable question. And it illustrates a few different mis misunderstanding, I don't want to say misunderstanding, but but perhaps a lack of clarity in terms of what the rib cage should be doing during normal, quiet, easy peasy, lemon squeezy respirations versus compensatory activity, which we're seeing with some of the stuff that Gail is discussing. So let's first talk about what should happen when I take a breath of air in and I take a breath of air out. We're going to illustrate how breathing should work with toothpaste. The reason why toothpaste is a, a useful uh, model to, to demonstrate kind of some of these concepts, which if you give credit to Daddy O Pops Bill Hartman for, for coming up with this, is it can illustrate how our bodies will move stuff when we, when we contract things. And so if I elicit some type of muscle contraction, like I squeeze the toothpaste tube, that squeezing reduces stuff in the area where that squeeze occurs. So for example, if if this was my elbow, because <laughs> you know Big Z is going to show his biceps in the debrief. But if I flex my elbow, that's like me squeezing stuff out of the front of the joint, right here like that. And so in the case of my joint, synovial fluid would be reduced in the anterior compartment. But then you'll notice, folks, that toothpaste is moving in the area where there is more space, in this case, the bottom of the tube. If we illustrate to the same elbow concept, when I flex my elbow, synovial fluid is going to move posteriorly. How does this relate to breathing? Well, I'm glad you asked. When you take a breath of air in, you have to make room for stuff that's entering your body. And that stuff is air. And the way that your thorax makes room for the air entering your body is it expands in all directions. So it's going to fill in all directions. What you should see is you should see intersegmental motion or relative motion occurring between each of the ribs. So if we're looking at it from the front, we're talking about the pump handle action, which is anterior and superior movement of the rib cage. But what you'll see is the ribs, if my fingers were the ribs, will kind of move apart slightly. Now, it's a small amount, but it, but it moves. 
on the sides, which is the bucket handle action, they should move outward and upward. And you, you'll see intersegmental motion of the rib cage. And in the back, you'll see the posterior thorax or dorsal rostral, if you want to get technical with the anatomy, that's going to move posteriorly and superiorly. And so all of this relative motion that occurs between each of the ribs allows for me to adequately fill the lungs needed during respiration. And then conversely, when I'm exhaling and I'm getting the air out, you're going to see the top part of the rib cage, so if the, the cap is the head and we'll say where the C is on the crest is the thorax, well, it's going to get smaller in, in every which direction. That's going to shoot the air out of my body. So in order for that to happen, what has to occur is I have to have all of the ribs getting smaller in all directions. So those, that space that was created between the rib cage, as we talked about before, is going to be reduced. So whereas the ribs moved apart, now they're going to come together. And as we can see with like uh, Freddie back here, the, the ribs are, there's not that much space between them, right? So you're not going to have a whole lot of movement happening. If you can see big extraneous movements happening at the rib cage, what's going on then is you're likely dealing with compensatory breathing mechanics. So I've, I've filled the amount of space that has to happen. And if I can't move any more space, so like say I continue to squeeze the toothpaste, and I can't get any more movement where there is space taken up, my only option is I have to orient it by bending it in some way, shape, or form. So for example, in the case of Gail talking about, well, when I exhale, the sternum comes down, but the ribs stay out. Well, what's likely going on is the thorax is actually just tipping forward. And conversely, if you see the thorax tilt posteriorly during inhalation, which you can all try this at home, if you take a breath of air in and you just keep going, 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 you'll notice that your torso goes forward. If your torso is moving forward, the thorax is actually tipping backward. And that's what's causing that forward translation of the thorax. Because I can't get any more movement between the ribs. My only option then is to change the orientation that my torso is going to be in. And that's the difference between these two concepts. I think the reason why maybe there's some confusion, and I'll take some blame on this, but because the rib movement that we're talking about is so very small, we almost have to use exaggerated actions to illustrate a point. And this is also true when we're talking about something like the sacral movement, right? Because when even though this model moves an asinine amount, there's really only about two degrees of motion available at the SI joint. And there's not that much motion available in the ribs. It's harder to see. An analogy that I like to talk about when, you know, people kind of get up in arms about the models and like, oh, you're, you're flapping the wings of the anominate around and, you know, that's not accurate, um, is, is looking at a map. So do we all, I'm all assuming that if you have a cell phone, you've probably used a map app of your choice to help yourself get around. But consider this, folks. Did you know that the map on your phone is not drawn to scale of how big the streets are in your town? Does that upset you? because it's not an accurate representation, right? It's not, because we, that, that's why we have things like models, and a map is a model. It's smaller, but it allows you to make decisions about driving around town, whereas if you couldn't have a map that's as large as your city or even the world. These models, the rib cage, the pelvis, things like that, are basically like a reverse map. It's an exaggerated representation to demonstrate something that's small, but still the muscles are pulling, the pelvic floor is changing, it's contractile amount, depending on whether you're breathing in or breathing out. The intercostals are contracting and relaxing depending on the location and whether you're breathing in and breathing out. So keep that in mind and that's probably why there might be some confusion in terms of 
why we're not actually seeing these massive rib cage movements when I breathe in and breathe out. Now that said, if I am seeing things like that occur, you're likely dealing with compensatory breathing mechanics. And this could correspond with movement limitations depending on what compensatory strategy you are dealing with. So the postures, just looking at them at rest, aren't inherently bad because based on the way someone's built, they might have a bias towards one position or the other. It becomes a problem if there's corresponding movement limitations that are impeding your ability to do what it is that you or your supreme clientele want to do. So we're gonna talk about some of the common movement compensatory postures and the subsequent limitations that they may present with in the thorax today. I got three for you. A posterior thorax tilt, an anterior thorax tilt, slouchy posture, and anterior and posterior compression, where we see a reduction of movement limitations every which way. So hold on to your butts, folks. We're about to get into it, and it's going to get nuts. Let's first talk about the posterior thorax tilt. So here's what I want you to think about. Why, why would these things happen? These movement compensations likely happen as a means to pick up range of motion when there is a loss of relative motion. Because you still have to demand certain actions that your body has to perform if you're moving in space. Let's talk about the posterior thorax tilt and what movements that will allow me to pick up. So if I have a situation where I have someone who's created muscle activity every which way, if that person was this toothpaste tube, I'm squeezing the toothpaste tube in all directions. So that means I don't have access to relative motion. What I mean by that is if I squeeze the bottom of the toothpaste tube, you'll notice the toothpaste comes up. And if I squeeze the top, the movement of the toothpaste goes down. Well, folks, if I squeeze it every which way, I ain't moving a whole lot of toothpaste now, am I? So what's my option then? Well, my option could be to tip the toothpaste posteriorly. So you see how I create a bend now in the toothpaste? And that allows me to pick up some certain movements. The same thing can happen in the thorax. So if I don't change the amount of airflow that's going on in the thorax, I can tip this puppy backwards like so. And what that's going to do, folks, is it's going to allow me to pick up certain motions that I might not be able to get otherwise at the humerus. What are those motions? Well, I'm glad you asked. What you'll see with this posterior tip, and visually you're going to see the thorax sitting a little bit behind the pelvis, but you'll see a magnification of external rotation-based measures. And I'll show you why that is. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put my arm at 90 degrees of abduction and zero degrees of external versus internal rotation, right? So this is like where we would test someone if we were to look at humeral rotation. Now watch what happens to my arm as I tip the thorax back. Boom. Well, folks, it looked like I just picked up external rotation, but here's the deal. I didn't move my humerus at all. All I did was change the resting position of my thorax, and that gave me the appearance that I had more external rotation. But it comes at a cost. What is that cost? It's a cost is a loss of motion at the glenohumeral joint in certain directions. So I don't have relative motion or the ability to have full excursion of my joint range of motion that I ought to have at the glenohumeral joint. So I cheat it by creating greater muscle activity on the back of the thorax. How do you know if this is a problem and you're dealing with it? You would look at your glenohumeral ranges of motion to determine that. Now what will typically happen is the total rotation in the glenohumeral joint, which should be about, you know, depending on who you're talking to, 160 to 180 degrees, is going to be less than that. 
what you're going to see is an increase of external rotation. So it's going to be 90. It's going to be 100, 110, 120 sometimes. And you'll see a significant drop off of internal rotation. Because think about this. If I bias, let's say I bias my humerus towards internal rotation. If I tip the thorax back, you can see that I actually lose that internal rotation. Now, classically, we would think that that's a, a down pump handle, but it's not. What it is, is it's merely me tipping the toothpaste backwards, and that's creating a glenoid position that doesn't allow me to get internal rotation because the glenoid or the scapula is simply following along with what the thorax is doing. So you'll see a loss of that total arc of rotation that should be there. The other thing that you'll see is a loss of shoulder flexion, and that's because this is actually still a restricted posterior thorax, because the stuff that's tipping my torso backwards is posterior musculature. That's going to limit my ability to expand the posterior thorax. And that's how you know that you're going to have a deficit in posterior expansion and subsequently a posterior thorax tilt. So that external rotation that you're seeing, you're thinking, wow, that ER is Gucci. It's not. It's a lie, a damn dirty lie. And you can tell because the total rotations dropped off and they'll still have limitations in some of the external rotation measures that we would conventionally look at. And that's how you know you have a posterior thorax tilt. Now what you do about it seems counterintuitive because as I had mentioned, if you have a drop off in internal rotation, typically that corresponds with a down pump handle. And then you would do things to create expansion in the front. But the reason why you have that internal rotation loss, now you could still have a down pump handle, but first issue that you have to deal with is the tilt. Because that tilt is actually more concentric muscle activity in the back. And it's because of the orientation change that you're seeing the loss of internal rotation. So in this particular scenario, you don't know if there is a down pump handle because creating expansion in the anterior thorax is restoring relative motions, right? That's getting the toothpaste to move intersegmentally. When I have a tip backwards, I don't have the capability of getting relative motion because the thorax isn't in a good orientation to allow that to occur. So what you have to do is you have to find things to reduce the posterior tilt of the thorax. And what that's going to involve is actually posterior expansion of the thorax, which makes sense because if my spine, I'll bring Ted in the mix, is doing this, stuff on the back is pulling the spine backwards. So I got to do stuff to expand it forwards. And I want to do that because if I just, you know, try to go the other direction, I might just orient the thorax into an anterior position. We need to restore relative motion for this group, but it's going to be getting posterior expansion first. Now here's an issue. A lot of times when these jokers reach, and I can say that because I'm one of these jokers. When they reach, what you'll often see when you're doing moves is they'll end up tipping the thorax even further back. So if you ever got someone on a goblet squat, say, and you have them reach the elbows back and they end up just having the hips go way forward and the torso back, that is a classic move that you'll see with someone who likes to tilt the thorax posteriorly. Well, poop. I see that a lot of my low reaches. And remember, as we've talked about in previous debriefs, zero to 60 is gonna get me that posterior expansion. But if that's just magnifying the tipping backwards, well, what do I do, big Z? Don't worry, I'll tell you what to do. The solution, folks, is you have to choose activities that are gonna minimize that person's ability to tip the thorax backwards. One way that I can do that is I can perform low reaches, zero to 60, in the supine position. Because if I'm in the supine position, 
the ground is going to be a physical limitation, a physical block that will prevent me from tipping backwards, especially if you're doing the tuck and things like that. You can also reduce the lever arm of your low reach by bending your elbow, which will make it easier to do. The supine cross connect is a great starting point for these individuals once you've taught the stack. Because if you haven't taught the stack, why are you talking to Zach? Once you've done something like a supine cross connect and maybe they feel really good, they're able to, to exhale, get the lower rib cage to drop and they're not tipping backwards, then you might go to something that encourages posterior expansion and standing. But here's the kicker. It's going to be, again, because I'm managing gravity now, more challenging to get that reach without tipping back. So just like we did with the supine position, you want to choose positions that are going to minimize my ability to tip the thorax backwards as I reach. And a way you can do that is actually by doing posterior expansion activities with more of a hinge-based posture. Because folks, a lot of times, when you work with someone who's got a posterior tilt of the thorax, the pelvis is going to be pushed ahead of the thorax. So the thorax is back, but the pelvis is forward. And many times when you try to encourage stacking activities with these peeps, which is your swayback pop type of population, and folks, if you want to learn more about that, you can, uh, there, I'll link a, a, a copy of the debrief that I talk about that in the show notes, which will be found on zackcouples.com forward slash slouching dash verse dash arching. Check it out. There's going to be a, a sick blog, the HD version, and there's going to be the podcast version. So that way you can really learn this material because I know it's tough the first passing through. But don't worry, I'll get you covered. With a sway back posture, though, when they're tipped way forward like this, when they try to do a tuck, because the ischium is oftentimes in line with the femur, they may end up just pushing the, the pelvis even more forward because stuff on the back is concentric. So what can be useful is actually doing things to get the ischium, bottom of the pelvis, behind the femur. And that, folks, looks like a hinge-based posture. That's why toe-touch progressions can actually be useful for that population. And you could use that for this population as well. But what I've been doing lately with this group that's been pretty successful is I'll do a bent over or a hinge based position and try a cross connect there. So there's some step ones that you can use. Um, the series that I like to do lately is I'll put someone up on a step, one leg, I'll have them hinge back and then I'll have them do a same connect where they're going. So if I got my left leg flexed, I'm gonna reach the left elbow to the left leg. And then you can follow that with a cross connect, which is going to be a little bit more of a rotational challenge. And both of those will encourage posterior expansion. The other nice thing about being in that hinged posture is when I'm folded back in a hinge position, well, now my spine, in order to do that posterior tip, has to do so against gravity. So it makes it inherently more challenging for someone to do that tipping backwards cheat especially if they're maintaining the stack. So that's another nice reason why doing something in a, in a hinge-based posture can be useful for this particular presentation. And so those would be the things I would be doing for a posterior thorax tilt. So to recap the posterior thorax tilt, you're going to see the thorax be behind the pelvis that magnifies external rotation but you have to go after posterior expansion because the stuff that tips the thorax backwards is on the back and you got to expand it. You'll want to do so in positions like supine or in a hinge posture in order to elicit the changes that you oh so desire. Now let's go into someone who's got an anterior thorax tilt, AKA Slouch City, you're the mayor, World of Warcraft bender, 36 hours, three Mountain Dews, what you going to do about it? You can see him, can't you? All right. So with this group, you kind of have the opposite situation that we had with the posterior thorax tilt. And so if I got my toothpaste, I'm going to squeeze it every which way. And the, the crest is right here. This person, instead of tipping the thorax backwards, is going to tip it forwards. 
And when I tip forwards, what will happen is that will allow me to pick up internal rotation. But again, this is in absence of the having full excursion at the glenohumeral joint. So I'll show you the same thing that I did with posterior. So I got my arm at 90 degrees of abduction. As soon as I slouch, watch what happens to my humerus. Boom. It moves towards internal rotation. So you see, I picked up IR. But then watch this, folks. If I bias my humerus into external rotation and I do the same thing, well, now I have a drop off of external rotation. And that's exactly how this particular presentation is gonna manifest. When you get them on the table, even though it looks like the pump handle is down, you'll actually see a magnification of internal rotation-based measures. A lot of times these people have full or near full. You'll see a drop off of shoulder external rotation. Well, how do I know that I'm dealing with this and not someone who's limited in posterior expansion? Same thing as with the posterior tilt of the thorax, you'll have a drop off of the total arc of rotation that should happen in the glenohumeral joint, meaning it'll be less than 160, 180. Shoulder flexion often is still limited with these peeps as well because there's continual drop off of relative motion at the glenohumeral joint. So if you see a lot of IR, limited ER, but then there's other internal rotation measures that are limited, total arc is non-existent, you're probably dealing with an anterior thorax tilt. Now what we do for this population, again, which seems counterintuitive because I have internal rotation, is actually to encourage anterior expansion. Because when I tip the thorax anterior, stuff on the front, pecs, rectus, damn near kildus, abdominis, is going to be more concentric. And because it's more concentric, you're not gonna be able to get an adequate fill in the anterior thorax. These folks are gonna be those ones, when you have them reach, they end up crunching, they get a ton of pec activity, they get pooch belly when they reach, all of those things are also soft indicators or, or signs of someone who might be exhibiting an anterior thorax tilt. And I had an aha moment this week because I have one of my longtime clients. He's one of these, these peeps. Uh, I work with them. We clear up internal rotation. External rotation is still limited. And anytime I've gone after posterior expansion, it gets pecs, neck pain, tension, problems. And I had a realization as I was walking yesterday that that's why I couldn't get a Mobetta. And I'll keep you posted. We'll see if it, see if my theory works. But, but I have seen this with other people. It is because he's dealing with a anteriorly tilted thorax. And so anytime I encourage low reaching, he just crunches that even further and problems ensue. So what you need to do for these particular folks is you have to do things to restore anterior expansion of the thorax. And just like we did with the posterior tilt, we want to choose positions that are going to make it a disadvantage for someone to bend the thorax forward or downward. Prone-based positions are really good in this regard. You just got to make sure you're not doing a press-up. So I don't want to tip the thorax back with this population. When I do something in prone, so like a prone on elbows or even like some of the, like the classic DNS positions or developmental postures, when you do the reach, you wanna make sure you push the thorax back without creating the bend. The nice thing about prone is you're using gravity to create anterior expansion both in the thorax and in the ab wall, which is advantageous. So I would be starting with prone-based positions first. Once you've done prone, then you wanna work on other activities to expand the pump handle. Some of my go-tos, and when I talked about the guy who I was talking about previously, he generally does these okay with minimal pain and discomfort. You'd be looking at landmine pressing because higher reaches, I would say more than 90, like 110, 120, it's gonna be harder for you to recruit the pecs and it's gonna encourage pump handle expansion in this particular population. Overhead pressing, whether it's half kneeling or something like an alternating Arnold press, could also be money for this particular presentation. 
And those would be the keys for restoring someone's movement capabilities if they have an anterior thorax tilt. To summarize, anterior thorax tilt, what you're dealing with is loss of relative motion, the thorax tips anteriorly as a unit that will magnify internal rotation-based measures, and it will reduce external rotation-based measures. You'll actually want to do, uh, do anterior expansion for this particular population. And the way you could do that is prone-based activities and then progressively working on overhead actions. If you deal with any of these peeps and you're wondering, well, Zach, how in the heck do I coach someone to reach without crunching or reach without tipping back? Maybe it's like conceptually you get it, but you're having a hard time because, well, I, I don't know what cues would be useful to do that. Well, I'll teach you those cues at my seminar, Human Matrix. Folks, we have one more in 2021, and it's going to be a slobber knocker. We're going to be in Las Vegas, Nevada uh, at, the home, at the home turf on December 4th and 5th. There's still a few spots available for that, so please check it out. If you can't make it, I get it. It's holiday time, even though you know, there's about 30-some people going to be at this one. Uh, we do have some 2022 dates. The first one, as of right now, is going to be May 7th and 8th in Buffalo, New York. The next one after that is May 28th and 29th in Seattle, Washington. And then we have August 6th and 7th in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm working on adding a few more, so stay tuned. The last compensatory thing that's going to be happening in the thorax that I'm going to be talking about today is anterior and posterior compression. So here's what I want you to think about when we're talking about this particular movement presentation. Whereas with the anterior and posterior tilt, we were seeing bending happening re respectively somewhere in the torso. With someone who has anterior and posterior compression, you don't see that bend, not much at least. What's happening here is you're getting progressive concentric activity both on the front and the back. And what that's going to do is it's going to flatten the thorax, making it more oval-shaped. When I have a more oval-shaped thorax, I can't rotate as well. If you look at this water bottle, it's cylindrical. And if I swing my hands around the cylindrical water bottle, you can see that it rotates easily. Whereas with this... Fit Soda, right? I wish they were sponsors because I love this stuff. If I squish the Fit Soda front to back, you can see that the rotation doesn't happen as well. The same thing occurs with someone who's anteriorly and posteriorly compressed. So if I have a lot of concentric activity on the front and I got a lot on the back, there's not much ability to rotate, and depending on the degree of movement restrictions, so think you got someone, like they maybe they got 30 degrees of external and 15 of internal, you're not going to get much rotation at all. They might not have an ability to create some of those bends that we saw with the previous compensatory strategies. There's a lot more concentric muscle activity and movement limitations, namely all their shoulder measures to some extent are gonna be limited. You'll see, and, and visually, they'll appear to have a wider rib cage. And this can be true of someone who's even got a narrow infrasternal angle, which the infrasternal angle, if you're just tuning into this, which um, again, if you check out the show, show notes, zackcouples.com forward slash slouching dash versus dash arching, um, I'll, I'll link something in that talks about the ISA. But basically what that is, is it would be as we can see on our dear friend Freddie Ribs, it's this portion, this angle of the rib cage that's right below the sternum. Someone who's narrow generally has a longer front to back rib cage. But if I have concentric muscle activity on the front side and the back side, what that can do is that can reduce those anterior and posterior dimensions and expand things outside to side. As a, as a consequence, there's a deficit in rotation that happens. And namely, when you test these wonderful people, they're gonna be limited every which way. And so what you have to do in this case is we have to figure out a way to start restoring particular motions. 
Now, here's the thing. In the case of someone who was able to tilt the thorax, well, that location that they're able to bend stuff does indicate that they have some ability to create more space or expansion in a given area. But if I don't have that capability and I'm locked up every which way and I can't really create any bends or orientation changes, well, crap, now I got a situation where I can't create those gradients to restore relative motion. So what do you do? Well, if I have someone who's got a lot of muscle activity every which way, you got to think frozen. You got to let it go. You got to teach them to release that muscle tension or reduce the muscle activity that's occurring when they move. If you've seen a lot of rolling recently on my YouTube channel, this is why I'm using it. Because if you have someone roll and move very slowly, easily, lazily, like one to two out of 10 effort, that helps teach them to start moving without gripping or squeezing so hard. And generally, with this type of individual, that is where you want to start. You want to get them to move and groove with as little tension effort as humanly possible. Because when you're inducing effort, that's going to require increased muscle activity, which is just going to reinforce the, the, the movement uh, strategies that they're using, which are probably not useful for increasing someone's movement repertoire. So rolling-based exercises are really useful in that regard. Once you've done that, then what you're going to do is you're going to utilize your testing to determine what the next course of action is. A lot of times with these particular people who are limited in all directions, the first movement strategy that they might get back is likely not going to be full relative motion. What they'll be able to do instead is they actually might start, be, start being able to tilt the thorax either backwards or forwards. And then if you got someone where they exhibit that movement strategy, you're in luck. Because now you can start using different expansion-based activities, either in one direction or the other, to help encourage them to restore some of the movement mechanics that you will so desire. So if you got someone who is either now exhibiting an anterior or posterior thorax tilt, you could go with a lot of the strategies that we talked about with the, the, the latter portion or the earlier portion of this debrief. One thing you might consider, though, is if I do have someone who's restricted front and back, and that's their tendency, you might consider utilizing side-lying positions to help restore some of the movement once you start going into some of your classic breathing-based actions. The reason why side lying is useful is because of science. There's a great article that was done by Takashima et al. that's shown if you put someone in the side lying position, gravity is going to reduce the side to side dimensions of the rib cage and increase the front to back dimensions of the rib cage, aka anterior expansion. Well, folks, by golly, buzz, that's what we need with this people. So doing things in side lying, but incorporating a lot of the reaches I had talked about with the previous compensatory strategies could be really useful. Once you've done those things, you've got a little bit more of a gradient. You could also justify doing activities that encourage rotation of the thorax because every time that I rotate, I'm going to get anterior expansion on one side and posterior expansion on the other. So to recap, anterior and posterior expansion what you want to do for those people is because they're limited in every direction, you need to get them to move with very little tension first. Then you want to create expansion with whatever the next strategy is that you're going to be seeing. Or if you're just continuing to increase space, but it's not full in either direction, you might consider doing rotational activities. And if you do that, you're going to have some loosey goosey peeps. You're going to be able to do a lot more stuff gym-wise or even, you know, out in the, the, the field that you want to be able to do with your shoulders, and no one ought to mess with you. And those are the big three compensatory strategies that I deal with on a regular basis, I'm sure you see a lot of, in the thorax. There are rotational-based ones as well, but you can apply the same principles that we talked about with some of these measures. Just do them one-sided. Unbelievable question, Gail. Folks, I think that that's a good stopping point for us today. 
I want to thank you all for tuning in to this debrief, and hopefully you got a little bit more clarity in terms of how to address some of these compensatory things that we see in the thorax. If you want to learn more, please check me out at zackcouples.com. Subscribe to the newsletter while you're there because you get a ton of free stuff to help you learn, especially the human matrix foundations, which if you kind of got lost in some of the jargon, that's a good place to start. Thank you so much for tuning in. You've been an incredible, outstanding, wonderful audience. And I hope that you keep it real enough to you where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving. And I'll see you next time. Deuces.